Hello, and welcome to the channel. I'm Dan Toller. You may have noticed that there was no intro music, and that I didn't say relevant history. That's because I pulled a fast one on you. Today's episode is not, strictly speaking, relevant history. This is a special bonus episode containing four smaller episodes I created with the Salad Tossers guys. I won't say too much to introduce these episodes since each one is self-contained with its own little intro and outro. Briefly, the first is about the 1904 Men's Olympic Marathon, possibly the worst run athletic event in history. The second is about Wojtek the Soldier Bear, a literal bear who served in World War II. The third is about H.H. H. Holmes, the first known American serial killer, and the last is an exploration of weird and unexplained events, from ghost ships to the visions of Joan of Arc. If you want to skip to a particular episode, I've put timestamps in the description, but I'd encourage you to stick around for the rest of the introduction. As you can see, these topics are a bit off the beaten path for relevant history, but they were perfect topics for irrelevant history, which is what this series is called. Sadly, I had overcommitted myself and was not able to continue making these, so Irrelevant History is now a limited series with only four episodes. And as of October 1st, my contract with the Salad Tossers is up, and the rights revert to me. Now, this limited series is free for everybody. Regular Relevant History episodes will resume next week as scheduled. Savvy listeners will remember me teasing this a couple of episodes ago, but at the time I'd said these episodes were coming only to Patreon. So what's the deal? Why am I putting them out here for free on the main channel? This brings us to the sad news I mentioned at the beginning of the last Normal episode. Nick, the guy at the Salad Tossers who handled most of their technical stuff, is no longer with us. What I did not tell you before is that, tragically, Nick took his own life. As bright as he was, and as promising as his future appeared, he was not yet 20 years old. These episodes represent a partnership between me and Nick. To some extent, they're a collaborative work, and after Nick's death, it didn't feel right to be putting them on Patreon and using them to make money. So instead, I spoke with Billy, uh, Nick's good friend and another member of the Salad Tossers team. And with his blessing, here's what we're going to do. Nick's family had asked that in lieu of flowers, people make a donation to the American Society for Suicide Prevention. You'll find a link to that charity in the episode description. If you feel the need to pay for this limited series in some way, click that link and make a donation. If you're an international listener, feel free to give to a similar charity in your country. Your donation might save a life. In keeping with that, I will be donating this month's Patreon donations, so if you're already a patron, I have already donated on your behalf. More importantly, most importantly, remember that you're not alone. No matter how dark things seem, your family and friends would much rather pick up the phone and listen to your troubles than receive a far more tragic phone call instead. Enough of me standing on my soapbox. Without further ado, here are all four episodes of the limited series, Irrelevant History. Hello. And welcome to Irrelevant History. I'm Dan Toller. The first modern Olympics in 1896 were held in Athens, Greece, the home of the original ancient Olympic Games, to honor their spirit and bring the Games into a new era. 
the 1900 Olympics, the next games, well, those were held in beautiful, historic Paris, France. The third modern Olympics, the 1904 Olympics, well, those were held in St. Louis, Missouri, smack dab in the middle of America's sparsely populated hinterland. And let me tell you, those 1904 games were among the worst in history. The entire organization was an absolute nightmare. The games were originally supposed to be in Chicago, which is a city with a little better rail access, a little bit more developed at the time, but there was a World's Fair in St. Louis at the same time in 1904, so rather than have two major international events just a few hundred miles apart, they decided to move the Olympics to St. Louis. Now, St. Louis at the time was not the large metropolitan city we know today. It was a city of sorts, but, for example, the roads were still mostly dirt. It just wasn't as developed as you would expect from a city that's about to host the Olympics. And transportation is even difficult at the time. It is over 700 miles to the nearest port, which, keep in mind, it's 1904. There are no airplanes. Everybody's got to come by boat. And because St. Louis is in the middle of the country, then they have to hop on a train and travel hundreds of miles further. So out of all the countries in the world, only 14 would even send athletes to the 1904 Olympics. Most of the participants were Americans. Now, there were enough crazy shenanigans at the 1904 Olympics to fill a book, and in fact, people have written books about the 1904 Olympics. One of the most notable things was the fact that there were actually fewer visitors to the Olympics than to the neighboring World's Fair, and that that World's Fair was run by white supremacists who had a bunch of exhibits with kidnapped Africans and performed what they called jungle games. But we won't be talking about that depressing incident today. We'll be talking about the 1904 Men's Olympic Marathon. This is a story of booze, rat poison, feral dogs, ruptured esophagi, a complete disregard for basic safety, and a Cuban mailman who just wouldn't quit. Felix Carvajal loved to run. He was only five feet tall, and he was a mailman, not an athlete, but he loved running, and he wanted to run in the Olympic marathon. So, in early 1904, he applied to the Cuban Olympic Committee for funding to compete and was promptly refused. So instead he raised the money he needed for himself. And he did this by running the entire 700-mile length of the island of Cuba. Now, with this money, he was able to get on a boat and travel to New Orleans. And it was in New Orleans that he lost all the rest of his money in a game of craps. But Felix Carvajal still wanted to compete in the Olympics, so he walked and hitchhiked his way up the Mississippi River all the way to St. Louis, uh, running much of the time. And when he got there without a place to stay, he managed to convince the American weightlifting team to let him stay with them. Apparently, he was just a really friendly guy, and everybody liked him. Now, on the day of the big race, Carvajal is not dressed for running. He only really owns one outfit. Now, these might be the early 1900s, and people might dress a little differently than they do today, but they're still basically wearing shorts and sleeveless shirts, right? Athletic gear. After all, they're about to run 26 miles. Carvajal, meanwhile, is wearing slacks, long johns, a long-sleeved shirt, and a newsboy cap. And because of the heat on this day, some of the other runners are actually concerned about his health. And one of them grabs a pair of scissors and cuts off his pants at the knee. Uh, so at least he's getting some kind of airflow. Yeah, did I mention the heat on the day of this race? 
On the day of the 1904 Men's Olympic Marathon, it's 90 degrees in the shade. We don't actually know what it was in the sun because nobody wrote down that number, but it could easily have been over 100 degrees out and it's humid. Modern best practice is to suspend a marathon if the temperatures are higher than the mid-70s. Now, if it's an elite race like the Boston Marathon or the Olympic Marathon, sure, that's still going to go on, but you would have a bunch of precautions and extra water stations and things of that nature to make sure that those runners are safe. Speaking of which, the organizers of the 1904 Olympics are doing an experiment to see if people run better when they're dehydrated. That's right. It is possibly over 100 degrees out, humid, and the only source of water along the entire 26-mile course is a well at the 6-mile mark. And that is by design. And if that's not bad enough, there is also a don't-drink-the-water situation going on. Charles J.P. Lucas, a trainer for the guy who won the gold medal that day, uh, he writes that, quote, the visiting athletes were not accustomed to the water and, as a consequence, many suffered from intestinal disorders, unquote. So it's hot, it's humid, and the little water there is will give you diarrhea. Now, at this point, at the start of the race, Felix Carvajal hasn't eaten for over 40 hours, right? After all, he doesn't have any money. So, after the race has started, he wanders over to some spectators and asks for some of the peaches they're eating. And when they refuse, he steals two and eats them while he runs along. And when he finishes the peaches, Carvajal is still hungry, so he turns off course into an apple orchard, grabs a few apples, and eats them. But they appear to be tainted, since Carvajal then gets sick to his stomach. Now, might also just be that he's cramping because he hasn't eaten in 40 hours and just gorged himself on fruit in the middle of a marathon, but regardless of the reason, he doesn't feel well and... This next part is kind of tough to believe. I almost don't want to tell this part of the story, but it's in every source I can find, so I'm kind of forced to accept it. See, when he gets sick, Carvajal just lays down on the side of the road and takes a nap. Yep, right there in the middle of the Olympic marathon. So let's leave him there peacefully sleeping and uh, talk about some of the other runners. Now, in all of Olympic history, from 1896 to the present, 1,560 runners have finished the men's Olympic marathon with a recorded time. So there have been more finishers, but those are the people who they actually bothered to write down the times for. And of those 1,560 runners... The winner of the 1904 Olympics has spot number 1,537. That's right. Out of all the runners ever to log a time in the men's Olympic marathon, only 23 ran slower than the winner of the 1904 marathon. At 3 hours and 28 minutes... The winning time is 28 minutes longer than the next longest winning time ever. And in fact, the last runner to finish in the most recent men's Olympic marathon in 2016, uh, Methkal Abudre of Jordan, he came in 139th place at 2 hours and 46 minutes. That's nearly 45 minutes faster than the winner in 1904. Now, this is partially because of better training and uh, better athletic equipment and better courses, so marathon runners have just gotten faster in general over time, but it's also because at the 1904 Olympics, the organizers haven't bothered to block off traffic. This is not a 
terribly urban area in the sense of uh, a downtown Manhattan or something like that, but it's still a growing city, and the runners still have to dodge cars, trucks, and pedestrians uh, as they go, and there are even multiple railway crossings, okay? That said, we can still attribute the slowness of the race mostly to the obscene heat and lack of water, and the dust also doesn't help. In addition to everything else, these guys are dealing with insane amounts of dust. Missouri has been going through a drought, and the marathon, as I said, is being run on dirt roads, and the runners are kicking up clouds, but worse, they're being accompanied by cars with referees and trainers and doctors who are monitoring this weird dehydration experiment, and all of those cars are kicking up even more dust. They're also putting out a lot of smoke. Remember, this is 1904. These are not exactly green vehicles here. And Charles J.P. Lucas, uh, the trainer who was there, he also tells us that there are actually areas where the road is blocked by fallen stones and the runners sort of have to pick their way across and try not to cut their feet. And there are multiple hills along the course. So even for elite athletes, this is possibly the most difficult Olympic marathon course in history. But the dust is the real killer. Almost literally. Uh, it brings down two of the original four favorites to win the race. The first of these is a man named John Lorden. John Lorden is an American who won the Boston Marathon the previous year. He's an elite runner, and a lot of people expect him to take the gold medal, but he makes it two blocks before he starts coughing uncontrollably and has to quit. And another American runner, another one of the favorites, a man named William Garcia, well, he collapses at the 19-mile mark, and he's actually coughing up blood. He is picked up by a passing car, and upon examination, it turns out that he has swallowed so much dust that it actually sanded away the lining of his esophagus. And if he hadn't been picked up by that car and gotten medical treatment, he probably would have died. In fact, of 32 runners to start the race, only 14 would finish. Now, if you count nine entrants who didn't even start, then only 34% of entrants finished. This is an Olympic record for the worst entrance to finishers ratio in any race ever. Regardless, the downfall of Lorden and Garcia leaves two men, Thomas Hicks and Fred Lors, also Americans, as the two main contenders. Hicks has finished sixth in the Boston Marathon twice, in 1901 and 1902, and Fred Lors is actually a bricklayer by trade. He's from the Bronx, and he had to run a special qualifying heat at night since he couldn't get off work during the day to run in the normal qualifier. Well, Lors is among the leaders for the first nine miles, but he starts to cramp up. And like the majority of the runners, actually, he decides to quit. But he hitches a ride with his trainer back to the stadium. Right, the race starts in a stadium, the runners run around town, and then it ends in a stadium. Well, Lors is hitching a ride back, but around the 20-mile mark, the car breaks down. Well, at this point, Lors feels better, so he gets out and jogs the rest of the way, and, naturally enough, finishes before any of the other runners. And when Lors crosses the finish line, the stadium erupts in cheers. And remember, these people have not been watching the entire race. They don't know that Lors rode most of the way in a car. They saw a bunch of runners leave the stadium, and now, from what they can tell... Lors is the first one to get back, so a band starts playing, and Alice Roosevelt, the daughter of U.S. President Teddy Roosevelt, begins to put the gold medal over Lors's head, but 
at the last second, some witnesses who had seen him in the car arrive in the stadium, and they cry foul. Lors claims it was all a joke and that he wasn't actually going to accept the medal, and the crowd goes back to waiting for an actual winner. Meanwhile, Thomas Hicks is barely stumbling along. But when he gets word that Lors did not actually win, he realizes he can still capture the gold, and so do his trainers. Among these trainers is J.P. Lucas, the gentleman we already referred to. And by the way, you can find Lucas's book, The Olympic Games 1904, for free on Google Books if you want to read more about this. Here is how Charles J.P. Lucas, the renowned athletic trainer of his day, describes the very latest in athletic training from 1904. He says, quote, Ten miles from the finish, Hicks began to show positive signs of collapse. When he asked for a drink of water, it was refused him, and his mouth was sponged out with distilled water. He managed to keep up well until seven miles from the stadium, and then the author was forced to administer one sixtieth grain of sulfate of strychnine by the mouth, besides the white of one egg. Although French brandy was in possession of the party, it was deemed best to abstain from further stimulants so long as possible. Unquote. So, 16 miles into a marathon on a 100-degree day, they refused to give Hicks water, and instead they gave him a little bit of rat poison and some raw eggs. Well, at least they held off on the booze, which... By the way, Charles J.P. Lucas is a depressant, not a stimulant, but anyway, he continues, quote, Four miles from home, Hicks wanted to lie down and rest. Knowing what would happen from previous experience with marathon runners should Hicks lie down, those who had charge of the man refused to allow him to do so, but caused him to slow down to a walk as he had a lead of one and one-half miles at 19 miles. It was at this point that Lors of New York passed Hicks, and for several minutes it did appear as if the Cambridge man would collapse. But when informed that Loras was out of the race, Hicks appeared to take heart and started to run at a dog trot once more. As Hicks passed the 20-mile post, his color began to become ashen pale, and then another tablet of 160th grain strychnine was administered him, and two more eggs besides a sip of brandy. His entire body was bathed in warm water, including his head, the water having been kept warm along the road by being placed on the boiler of a steam automobile. After the bathing with warm water, he appeared to revive and jogged along once more. Over the last two miles of the road, Hicks was running mechanically, like a well-oiled piece of machinery. His eyes were dull, lusterless. The ashen color of his face and skin had deepened. His arms appeared as weights well tied down. He could scarcely lift his legs while his knees were almost stiff. Unquote. So, they gave him more rat poison, two more raw eggs, and some brandy, and then they washed him down with hot water. This is just brilliant, but here's where it gets really good. Lucas continues, quote, The brain was fairly normal, but there was more or less hallucination. The most natural being that the finish was 20 miles from where he was running. His mind continually roved towards something to eat, and in the last mile, Hicks continually harped on this subject. Unquote. So he's hallucinating, but his brain is fairly normal. Okay, Charles J.P. Lucas. Here is how Hicks finishes the race. Quote, Near the finish of the race, at the last half mile, were encountered two bad hills. As the brandy carried by the party had been exhausted, Ernie Heiberg of New York kindly replenished Hicks's canteen, and though the Cambridge man had beef tea with him, he was refused this liquid, as no chance of upsetting his stomach was to be taken. After he had partaken of two more eggs, again bathed and given some brandy, Hicks walked up the first of the last two hills and then jogged down on the incline. This was repeated on the last hill, and as he swung into the stadium, 
Hicks bravely tried to increase his speed but could not. For as it was, he had scarcely strength enough left to run the last 440 yards of the distance. It was the intention of some of the Olympic Committee to award Hicks the Francis Trophy after the race on the field, but he was in too precarious a condition to receive it and was hurried off to the gymnasium, where a bunch of doctors made a physical examination of Hicks and all the other men and found that Hicks's vitality was very low. Unquote. Well, for a guy who's just run a marathon in insane heat while being given brandy and rat poison and raw eggs, I would say very low is an understatement. The day after the race, Hicks announced his retirement from running, and indeed, he would never run another marathon again. Now, Fred Lors, the guy who had caught the ride in the car, well, he would be suspended from amateur running for this stunt, but he'd be reinstated later that year and would go on to win the Boston Marathon in 1905 without the use of an automobile. There were a couple of other runners that day worth mentioning. Uh, two of them, Len Tanyane and Jan Mashani, were the first two black Africans to compete in the Olympics. They came representing South Africa, and they finished in ninth place and 12th place, respectively. And Tanyane would have done better and may even have meddled, but he was attacked by wild dogs, which had somehow gotten loose near the race course, and these dogs chased him more than a mile off course before he was able to lose them and find his way back to the race course. As for the silver and bronze medalists, uh, Albert Corey would win second place. Uh, he was a Frenchman living in Chicago, so his medal was recorded as an American medal, and it still is, but it should really have gone to France. And the third place winner, the bronze medalist, was Arthur Newton of Massachusetts, who finished with a time of 3 hours, 47 minutes, and 33 seconds. That is over an hour worse than the last place finisher in the most recent Olympics. So, what about Felix Carvajal, the Cuban mailman who dressed too warmly, ate bad apples, and passed out? Well, he woke up and kept on running, and despite stopping along the way to chat with several onlookers, Carvajal steadily gained and passed most of the other runners, and he eventually finished fourth. Charles Lucas describes his pace as, quote, slow, less than a dog trot, but strong, unquote. And he says, quote, had Carvajal had anyone with him, he was totally unattended. He would not only have won the race, but would have lowered the Olympic record, unquote. Now, I'll go out on a limb and say that Carvajal was better off without Lucas's training methods, although he probably would have done better if he hadn't fallen asleep or stopped to chat with anybody. In fact, even as it stands, under modern anti-doping rules, Carvajal would have earned a bronze medal for his efforts. See, strychnine, the rat poison that was given to Thomas Hicks, well... That has been banned since 1908 as a performance-enhancing substance. So, Hicks would have been disqualified, and Carvajal would have been third by default. Sadly, his finishing time was never recorded, but eyewitnesses say that Carvajal appeared to float across the finish line. He certainly impressed his own countrymen enough that in 1906, he would earn a spot on the official Cuban Olympic team. But... On the way to Athens, he would disappear when his ship stopped off in Italy. Carvajal was assumed dead, and obituaries were even published in Cuba, but several months later he would turn up again on a ship from Spain, very much alive. Apparently when he got to Europe, he decided to party and ended up missing the boat to Athens. Despite running in several more amateur events over the course of his life, Carvajal would never again compete in the Olympics or even win a race. But for a few hours in 1904, he was the craziest part of the craziest Olympic marathon in history. 
If you liked this episode of Irrelevant History, you can find my regular podcast, Relevant History, on all major platforms. You can also find all my content at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening. Hello, and welcome to Irrelevant History. I'm Dan Toller. The story of Poland in World War II is one of tragedy, betrayal, years of heartbreak, and a lot of dark things. But it's also an inspiring story with a lot of heroes. This is a country that literally got conquered completely, and came back from the ashes. We're about to talk about one of those Polish national heroes, a soldier named Wojtek the Bear. A little background here, we all are sort of aware of the vague outlines of World War II, right? On September 1st, 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland on uh, some flimsy excuses, and the Blitzkrieg, this lightning-fast, armor-led invasion, it was initially a big success. The Germans took a lot of territory, they captured a lot of men, but the Polish army still, by mid-September, had hundreds of thousands of troops in the field and controlled most of the eastern half of Poland. Now, the Polish plan at this time was to fall back to a mountainous area in the southeastern part of the country called the Romanian Bridgehead. Because it's mountainous, this area can be easily defended, and... As you might have guessed, because it's called the Romanian Bridgehead, this area is right next to Romania, which is a friendly country with you know, some seaports and rail lines where the Polish army can continue to be supplied by the other allies. As a matter of fact, by mid-September, a steady stream of cargo ships are crossing the Mediterranean Sea to deliver tanks, artillery, ammunition, and even aircraft from France and Britain to help the Polish. And the Polish high commander, a man named Marshal Edvard Rydz-Smigli, he plans to defend eastern and southern Poland while waiting for the French and British to attack Germany from the west, from the other side. And to do this, he's going to use pretty much all his troops. You see, the Polish have a peace agreement with the Soviet Union, which is to their east, and they only leave a few thousand troops on the Soviet border. The rest of them, the entire Polish army, more or less, is over fighting the Germans. But on September 17, 1939 the Soviet Union announces that due to massive German military successes, Poland has ceased to exist, and that in this state of anarchy, Soviet troops are moving in to restore order and protect the common people. This is just a bald excuse for Stalin to invade Poland from the east, and As a matter of fact, the Soviets had a secret agreement with the Nazis beforehand that they were going to do this and divide Poland up together. Well, this sudden invasion of almost a million Soviet troops from the east, there's nothing those few thousand Polish border defensers can do about that. 
I don't care how dug in you are, how well armed you are against those kind of odds, you're just going to have to run away. And so they do. And between the Soviet invasion and then continued pressure from the Germans, this orderly withdrawal, this strategic withdrawal towards the Romanian bridgehead turns into a rout. And of nearly a million Polish soldiers who started the war on September 1st, only about 120,000 escape by the end of September. They get out through Romania and they are transported to France and they will continue fighting until the end of the war as a very important part of the Allied war effort. But in the meantime, Poland itself has been entirely occupied and the government is now in exile in Great Britain. What happens to the rest of these Polish soldiers? Right? Surely most of them were not just killed, right? Well, no, most of them were captured. Most of them were then taken to POW camps by either the Germans or the Soviets. And those in Soviet hands are sent to work camps throughout Siberia. And incidentally, during that time, tens of thousands of them are killed by the Soviets in a series of massacres. But this situation of imprisonment and death does not last for long. In June of 1941, everything changes. It turns out you just can't trust Adolf Hitler. Who'd have thought? Yeah, he invades the Soviet Union, right? And all of a sudden, Stalin needs friends. So one of the first things he does to forge an alliance with the British and get as much help as he can is he repudiates the agreement that he had had with the Nazis to divide up Poland. And he instead signs a deal with the Polish government in exile that the Soviet Union will recognize Poland's pre-war boundaries and release the Polish prisoners. And this agreement puts most of those Polish former prisoners under British command. Now, a couple of months after Hitler invades the Soviet Union, right, in that very famous June 1941 invasion, Operation Barbarossa. Well, a couple of months later, in August 1941, a less well-known invasion takes place, at least in the West. And in that invasion, the British and Soviets jointly launch a surprise invasion of Iran. The effect of this invasion is twofold. First, it denies the Germans access to Persian oil. They had been getting oil from the Iranians. Now they're not going to get that oil anymore. And the other thing this invasion does is it creates a land route between the Soviet Union and British-controlled territories in the Middle East. So people and supplies can get back and forth, and you can, for example, walk and take a train from Siberia all the way to Egypt, which is precisely what many of these released Polish prisoners do. And this group of prisoners is collectively called the Anders Army. It's named after its commander, a man named Vladislav Anders, and to begin with, there are a little over 25,000 of them. And as the first members of the Anders army travel through Iran, well, that is where the story of Wojtek the Bear begins. You can already see the potential for drama here. Anything about World War II is bound to be exciting, but... I've left out one important detail. See, Bear isn't a nickname. Wojtek the Bear is an actual bear. The Anglo-Soviet invasion had created a wave of refugees throughout Iran, right, throughout 
what they called Persia at the time still. And as the Polish soldiers, hardly much more than refugees themselves at this time, as they crossed through the mountains, they came across a young man who was hungry. And in thanks for giving him some food, the young man gives them a small brown bear cub in a sack. Another version of the story says that a Polish lieutenant purchased the bear, but either way, this is a tiny cub whose mother had been killed by hunters and who had been left to fend for himself. The soldiers named this cub Wojtek, which is a Polish name that means he who is happy in battle, or a little less formally, just happy warrior. And at first, Wojtek is malnourished, and he even has trouble swallowing, but the soldiers mix up some condensed milk and put it in a bottle, and they're able to get him to drink it, and he recovers, and he starts to grow. And in North Africa, as the troops are stationed there, Wojtek is formally assigned to a pair of caretakers— a couple of soldiers named Heinrich Zakarowicz and Demeter Zavlugo of the 22nd Artillery Supply Company. Being a supply company, this group usually works behind the lines, which is a good place for an animal that's turning into somewhat of a mascot for the army. Wojtek grows up as one of the soldiers, and as smart animals do, he imitates his human caretakers. He eats their food, ordinary soldiers' rations, and he follows them around and usually bunks with them, and he even learns to salute when he's greeted. He eats and drinks at mealtimes, and his favorite food is beer. Apparently some of the young soldiers thought it would be funny to get him drunk, and joke was on them because being a large animal, he did not get drunk, and they did. He also likes to smoke cigarettes. Apparently, he will usually take a single puff and then swallow the cigarette. It never seems to hurt him. Yeah, Wojtek enjoys a beer and a smoke with the boys after a day's work, and he's also partial to a cup of coffee in the morning. Now, not all of his diet is unhealthy. The soldiers also give him fruit and honey and other nutritious foods. At one point, he actually breaks into the camp kitchen and eats an entire huge jar of honey. And eventually, his formal rations come out to the rations that two soldiers would eat in a day. And he also does a little bit of hand-to-hand -hand combat training. Wojtek the bear loves to wrestle, and he loves wrestling so much that new recruits to the 22nd Supply Company are often encouraged to get in the ring with him as a sort of initiation. Many uniforms are torn, but there are no serious injuries. Apparently, when Wojtek actually pins anybody down, he starts playfully licking their face like a pet dog. In... A 2011 BBC interview, a 94-year-old Polish veteran named Wojciech Narewski said, quote, We used to say that even though he's in a bear's skin, he has a Polish soul. As he grew up from being a cub, he was surrounded by Poles, and he grew with us. He was very kind, he was very sociable, he felt as if he was one of the gang. Unquote. Throughout 1943, the Anders Army remains in Egypt, training, filling a support role, and continuing to receive recruits and existing soldiers from Siberia. By 1944, the army is almost 100,000 strong, this army of Polish exiles, and they're going to be attached to the British Eighth Army attacking Italy. To do this, they are going to need to cross the Mediterranean from Egypt to Naples on British transports. And on British ships, mascot animals are not allowed, only soldiers. So, 
the soldiers of the 22nd Artillery Supply Company do the logical thing, and they simply enlist Wojtek officially as a soldier. Uh, he is given the rank of private, and he receives an official military ID, serial number, and, yes, even a salary. And so, on October 14, 1944, the 22nd Artillery Supply Company boards a British transport ship bound for Naples, with Wojtek along for the ride. By now, he weighs over 200 kilograms. That's 440 pounds, give or take. And when the company arrives in Italy, they head north towards the front line. And the veteran Nerebsky says in his interview, quote, When we were fighting in Italy, close to the Adriatic, Wojtek loved it because we were very close to the sea. Our company would often move from place to place, and Wojtek was carried on the company's crane truck. He was tied with a chain, much like a cow, but breaking the chains didn't prove to be a problem at all. Often he would stand up and rest his paws against the roof of the driver's cab. One day, it was a very hot day in June or July, he broke free from his chains and saw that the sea is only 50 meters away. He just ran off towards the beach, and on the beach there were girls who were bathing. So the bear ran onto the beach, but completely ignored the girls who had started shouting. We called out to them, saying, Girls, don't worry, in Italian. This bear is very well behaved. He won't do you any harm. He was not in the least bit interested in the girls, just in the sea, because he wanted to go for a swim. He was a very good swimmer. Unquote. Soon, the 22nd Artillery Supply Company is called into service in the Battle of Monte Cassino. This is one of the most famous battles of the Italian campaign, maybe the most famous, and it involves the Germans setting up a defense line across basically all of Italy. And in this one area of the front, there is a high ridge, uh, including a medieval monastery, where they are putting up a stiff defense. And the Allies have tried a number of times to take this monastery, and the Germans have kept beating them back, and the Allies have lost a lot of guys here. And, well, the British have tried, the Americans have tried... Now it's time for the Polish to give it a go. During the assault, the men of the 22nd are loading huge howitzer rounds that come in their own crates. These are giant, giant shells that weigh uh, 308 pounds apiece. It takes four men to carry one of these shells in a crate uphill to where the howitzers are so the gunners can keep loading them. And they're taking them off transports and then putting them on trucks and then they're taking them off trucks and they're walking them over to the artillery and following the lead of his fellow soldiers, Wojtek also begins hauling and stacking crates. And at his size, he can lift one all by himself. And he does again and again and again. And by some accounts, he even at one point follows Henrik Zakarovitz, one of his handlers, forward under fire, hauling ammunition all the way up to some howitzers that are near the tip of the spear, right, as close as artillery is going to get anyway to the tip of the spear, under enemy fire. And for his dedication and courage under fire... Private Wojtek is promoted to corporal. For the rest of the war, the 22nd Supply Company would see little other serious action, at least nothing quite as intense as the Battle of Monte Cassino. And at the end of the war, they would ship out to Edinburgh, Scotland, to await a settlement on the fate of their country. Remember, Poland had been 
conquered by the Germans and the Soviets, and then quote-unquote liberated by Soviet troops, but now that the war was over, would Stalin keep his word? Or would the Soviet Union simply keep Poland? The answer to both of those questions is more or less yes. Stalin mostly keeps his word regarding Polish territorial integrity. The nation of Poland is restored to existence, but the Soviet Union keeps the part of Poland that they had taken during the 1939 invasion. On the other hand, Poland is compensated with an equivalent amount of land in East Prussia, which is taken from the Germans as war reparations. So, all things being equal, they come out more or less as they went into the war. However, under Soviet occupation, Poland would be forced to adopt a communist government. While mostly running their own domestic affairs, they would not be free of Soviet domination until open elections were held in 1989, be 44 years after World War II. Since then, Poland has adopted a liberal constitution, joined NATO in 1999, and become a member of the EU in 2004. But that was far, far in the future for the soldiers of the 22nd, who in 1947 were returning to their families and in uncertain future. Communist Polish authorities wanted Wojtek to return to Poland and live in the Warsaw Zoo, but the men of the 22nd worked with local Scottish authorities to have Wojtek placed in the Edinburgh Zoo instead. There, he would enjoy his military pension and a long retirement. Wojtek would live until the age of 21, which is a bit short for a Syrian brown bear, but maybe not all that short when you consider that he was a smoker. In a 2007 interview in The Scotsman, Edinburgh resident Eileen Orr talked about seeing Wojtek at the zoo. She said, quote, My grandfather took a packet of cigarettes out of his pocket. Wojtek had been totally uninterested till then, but when he saw the cigarettes, he put out a paw the size of a soup plate, and my grandfather gave him one, and he smoked it. He'd never seen anything like it. Polish friends told us the Polish word for wave, and we went to the railings and waved and shouted it. He was like an old man and waved back. He was a very good-looking bear and very well-fed. He obviously liked being the center of attention and liked human beings. Unquote. While Wojtek may or may not have enjoyed his day-to-day -day life at the Edinburgh Zoo, there is no doubt that the very best parts of his retirement came when he received visits from his old friends. According to the stories, some of the soldiers from the 22nd would visit from time to time. And when they did, to the zookeeper's dismay, they would get in his enclosure with him and wrestle. If you liked this episode of Irrelevant History, you'll enjoy my main podcast, Relevant History, which is also available at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening. And welcome to Irrelevant History. I'm Dan Toller. 
True crime has become a popular genre of late. That's easy to understand why. People are fascinated with unusual stories and, in the end analysis, murder and things like that are unusual things. We hope. And the most unusual murders are oftentimes our favorite to hear about. What I'm talking about are serial killers, right? People love serial killer stories. One thing you'll notice about most of these stories is that pretty much all of them are from the 20th century, or this century. Why are all the serial killers showing up so late in the story of humanity? The simplest answer is that they aren't. They've always been around. It is only recently that serial killers, as we now think of them, have started to get caught. Before, someone might drift from community to community playing the role of the stranger and then moving on to the next town. Or they might blend in, right, in a very close-knit village where everyone is distantly related. That village just might have a higher rate of unfortunate accidents than the village without a serial killer in it. But the point is, we don't get to hear the story today because that person never got caught. One of the first serial killers that we do know about is notorious not just because he's one of the first, but because he is indeed one of the creepiest. This is the story of H.H. Holmes, a guy who built an entire hotel so he could trap and murder people. Holmes did this in a time and a place ripe for strangers. He did it in the late 1800s in Chicago during the run-up to the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Now, officially known as the World's Columbian Expedition, this fair was one of the pre-internet ways that uh, folks from around the world could connect. Companies and countries and inventors from all over the place would come to these world's fairs and show off what they had created. The 1893 fair, among other things, would feature a demonstration by Nikola Tesla and George Westinghouse. The entire fair would be lit with electric lighting, which was something that was out of science fiction at the time. And this particular fair was also special for Chicago. Just a couple of decades earlier in 1871, the entire city, most of it, had been destroyed by a fire. And this fair was a chance to show not just the country, but the entire world that Chicago was back on the map. So... For a young city taking its turn on the world stage, strangers were not just welcome, they were strongly encouraged. And that is the world in which H.H. Holmes operated. But before we talk about Holmes and his hotel, let's back up a little bit and talk about who H.H. Holmes is. Holmes was born as Herman Webster Mudgett in 1871. He would marry young at the age of 17 and go on to attend medical school at the University of Michigan. While he was there, he would start what would become a long-term criminal enterprise. He would take out life insurance policies on non-existent relatives steal medical cadavers, disfigure them, and then claim that those cadavers were his dead relatives so he could collect on the insurance policies. 
before DNA testing and technology like that, insurance scams were a little bit easier to pull off. And another reason Holmes is able to do this is because everyone who meets him seems to like him. Anytime you read about Holmes, you'll read about stories where he's deep in debt and creditors will come screaming and yelling at him and they will leave smiling and shaking hands with him because he's just such a likable guy. He's charming, he's pleasant, and he's particularly popular with women. During this time, the young Herman Webster Mudgett would marry his first wife, a woman named Clara, and they would have a son together. Shortly after this son's birth, Mudgett would become abusive, and so Clara would take their son back to her parents' house in New Hampshire and never see him again. As it turns out, she may have been very lucky. After finishing medical school, Mudgett would move around the country, taking jobs in Philadelphia and Minnesota, among other places, and everywhere he went, people seemed to die or mysteriously disappear. In 1886, Mudgett would move to Chicago. At this time, there were enough creditors looking for him that he would change his name to Henry Howard Holmes in order to leave behind his past. It's another thing that was a little bit easier back then. And thank goodness he did change his name, right? I mean, H.H. Holmes is such a perfect name for a serial killer, particularly a dapper, charming serial killer. Nobody wants to talk about Herman Webster Mudgett. Here in Chicago, in 1886, H.H. H. Holmes was born. And at this time, he would also remarry, marry for a second time, technically. He never actually divorced Clara, technically. But anyway, he would get remarried, this time to a woman named Murda, uh, with whom he had a daughter named Lucy. And the Holmes family moved into a house in the suburb of Willamette, while Holmes himself spent most of his time in Chicago. And in Chicago, Holmes took a job at a drugstore. Eventually, he would buy out the old owners. To pay for the purchase, he would immediately mortgage all of the shop's fixtures. He was now H.H. H. Holmes' physician and pharmacist. Now, Chicago in the late 1800s was a boom town. It was growing rich from its status as a central rail hub with access to the Great Lakes. That time, the city was full of slaughterhouses. Cattle from the Midwest would get shipped up to Chicago where they would be butchered and then the beef could be shipped out to the country. So, in 1886... Holmes purchased the property across the street from the pharmacy, and there he built a larger building with retail space on the first floor and living space on the second and third. He's looking to take advantage of this rapidly growing city, and he would do this for cheap by hiring his own laborers and then refusing to pay them simply by saying that their work was substandard. And this didn't just keep costs down, it also served a second purpose. See, it kept any one laborer from learning too much about how the building was designed. And Holmes had designed this building himself. This was what would eventually become his notorious so-called murder castle. Eric Larson describes the building in his book, The Devil in the White City, he says, quote, The building's broad design and its function had come to him all at once, like a blueprint pulled from a drawer. He wanted retail shops on the first floor to generate income and allow him to employ as many women as possible. Apartments would fill the second and third. His personal flat and a large office would occupy the second floor corner overlooking the intersection of 63rd and Wallace. These were the basics. It was the details of the building that gave him the most pleasure. 
he sketched a wooden chute that would descend from a secret location on the second floor all the way to the basement. He planned to coat the chute with axle grease. He envisioned a room next to his office fitted with a large walk-in vault with airtight seams and asbestos-coated iron walls. A gas jet embedded in one wall would be controlled from his closet, as would other gas jets installed in apartments throughout the building. There would be a large basement with hidden chambers and a sub-basement for the permanent storage of sensitive material. Unquote. By sensitive material, the author means dead bodies. This airtight vault is an execution chamber. And construction would take four years. This is what happens when you hire day laborers and refuse to pay them. But by 1890, the construction was finally complete. And at that time, Holmes sold his old pharmacy to a buyer who was pleased to see that there was no competition in the neighborhood, and then the next month he would open up his own newer, bigger pharmacy across the street in his new building. Now, it seems like at this time Holmes was planning to murder people in his own personal apartment. This was not originally designed as a hotel, but... That same year, 1890, Chicago would be announced as the host for the 1893 World's Fair. This leads to a huge influx of laborers into the city to prepare all of these new buildings that are being constructed specifically for the fair. And it also means that there are going to be a ton of tourists in town for like several months in 1893. So Holmes decides that he is going to use his building as a hotel for that event. During this time, he takes the opportunity to put another finishing touch on his building. He installs a new furnace in the basement. And he registers a phony glass-bending company and then has this industrial kiln built to specific specifications, and it turns out what it actually is, is a crematorium designed to completely eliminate odors. And it would not take long before Holmes claimed his first confirmed victim. The next year after the completion of his new building, Holmes began an affair with one of his employees, a woman named Julia Connor. Well, her husband also worked for Holmes, and when he found out about the affair, he got a divorce, which left Julia and the couple's young daughter, Pearl, living in an apartment upstairs with Holmes, who, let's not forget, also still has a wife in the suburbs. This leaves Holmes in a little bit of a bind, uh, and he gets into an even worse bind when, just before Christmas, Julia announces that she's pregnant and demands that he marry her. This would be hard for him to get away with, so he promises that if Julia will let him give her an abortion, which he is a doctor, after all, he can do that, if she will let him give her an abortion, then he will marry her. And so she agrees, and on Christmas Eve... Of 1891, H. H. Holmes puts a chloroform-soaked rag over Julia's mouth, ostensibly to put her under for the procedure, but he keeps going until she's dead. And he does the same thing to young Pearl, and actually disposes of the bodies as medical cadavers. The Flesh is removed from their bones, and the skeletons are mounted, and Holmes then sells them as medical specimens, which was surprisingly easy to do back then, and skeletons coming from a doctor in those days didn't raise any red flags. Now, the story of the murder hotel has often been exaggerated. For example, there were no torture chambers or mass murders in the hotel, but Holmes did kill several people, including a series of lovers. Uh, 
This is the most well-known part of his story, so I won't go too far into it. But with the fair in full swing, in 1893, the pace of the killings seems to pick up. No one takes much notice when an employee suddenly quits and disappears, or a guest takes off without paying. People are coming and going at a frantic pace, and... Well, if a few folks just disappear, who's going to suspect the hotel owner? And given his station as a landlord, an employer, and a doctor, very few people ever become suspicious of H.H. H. Holmes during this time period. He's even interviewed by several detectives hired by the families of people who were last seen at his hotel, but always as a witness, none of them ever seem to suspect that this charming young man is a serial killer. They were interviewing him in the capacity of a boss or a landlord or a hotel owner and just looking for information. At the same time, Holmes has now gotten himself into yet another marriage. With his wife still living in the suburbs, he has decided to get himself hitched to a young Texas socialite named Minnie Williams. He has convinced her to invest all of her assets into a new business with him, which, unbeknownst to her, this is just a shell company for him to get all of her money. And she has a sister. And this sister named Anna is starting to get suspicious of this guy, Holmes, who is seemingly uh, taking Minnie for a ride. Ever the charmer, Holmes does the logical thing, and he invites Minnie's sister, Anna, to come and visit for the fair. Since his building is now a hotel, he and Minnie are living in an apartment elsewhere in Chicago, and Anna's going to stay with them. And she does, and they spend some time at the fair, and Anna comes to like Holmes. And then, on January 5th, 1893... He invites her to come tour his hotel before she leaves town, and here is how Eric Larson describes what happens next. Larson says, quote, Holmes knew that most, if not all, of his hotel guests would be at the fair. He showed Anna the drugstore, restaurant, and barber shop, and took her up to the roof to give her a broader view of Englewood and the pretty tree-shaded neighborhood that surrounded his corner. He ended the tour at his office, where he offered Anna a seat and excused himself. He picked up a sheaf of papers and began reading. Distractedly, he asked Anna if she would mind going into the adjacent room, the walk-in vault, to retrieve for him a document he had left inside. Cheerfully, she complied. Holmes followed quietly. At first, it seemed as though the door had closed by accident. The room was utterly without light. Anna pounded on the door and called for Harry. She listened, then pounded again. She was not frightened, just embarrassed. She did not like the darkness, which was more complete than anything she had ever experienced. Far darker, certainly, than any moonless night in Texas. She rapped the door with her knuckles and listened again. The air grew stale. Holmes listened. He sat peacefully in a chair by the wall that separated his office and the vault. Time passed. It was really very peaceful. A soft breeze drifted through the room, cross-ventilation being one of the benefits of a corner office. The breeze, still cool, carried the morning scent of prairie grasses and moist soil. The panic came, as it always did. Holmes imagined Anna crumpled in a corner. If he chose, he could rush to the door, throw it open, hold her in his arms and weep with her at the tragedy just barely averted. He could do it at the last minute, in the last few seconds. He could do that. Or he could open the door and look in on Anna and give her a big smile just to let her know that this was no accident, then close the door again, slam it, and return to his chair to see what might happen next. Or he could flood the vault right now with gas. The hiss and repulsive odor would tell her just as clearly as a smile that something extraordinary was underway. He could do any of those things. He had to concentrate to hear the sobs from within. 
The airtight fittings, the iron walls, and the mineral wool insulation deadened most of the sound. But he had found with experience that if he listened at the gas pipe, he heard everything much more clearly. This was the time he most craved. It brought him a period of sexual release that seemed to last for hours, even though in fact the screams and pleading faded rather quickly. He filled the vault with gas just to be sure. Holmes returned to the Wrightwood apartment and told Minnie to get ready. Anna was waiting for them at the castle. He held Minnie and kissed her and told her how lucky he was and how much he liked her sister. During the train ride to Inglewood, he seemed well rested and at peace, as if he had just ridden his bicycle for miles and miles. Unquote. Neither Minnie nor Anna Williams would ever be seen again. But within a week, Holmes had canceled the lease for their apartment, and within another week, he had become engaged again, this time to a woman named Georgiana Yoke. At this point, the fair is starting to wind down, and Holmes's creditors are closing in. The assets he has left of Minnie's aren't cash. What he has is some land, some commercial property in Fort Worth, Texas, but he can't immediately turn that into cash to pay off all of these creditors who he owes money to. At this time, in October of 1893, a fire breaks out on the third floor of his hotel, and he files an insurance claim. And because of his financial struggles, the insurance company is suspicious, but they can't actually prove arson. However, the policy was taken out in a fictitious name. Holmes has been using a lot of different pseudonyms to keep perpetrating his frauds, again, something you could get away with more easily back then, and the insurance policy is actually in the name of Hiram S. Campbell. So... The insurance company says that they will only pay to Campbell and only in person, which is a problem for Holmes because they already know what he looks like, so he can't go in and pretend to be Campbell, and at the same time, he can't really trust anyone enough to pull off this con on his behalf, so he is unable to collect the insurance claim. And as a result, he is unable to pay off his debts, so his creditors are now in the position where they decide to have him arrested. Well, Holmes finds out about this. He is talking to a friendly lawyer who somehow lets slip that these creditors are about to have a detective arrest him, and Holmes skips town. He leaves Chicago, and he takes with him his fiancée, Georgiana Yoke, and also his assistant, a man named Benjamin Peitzel, who doesn't know about everything Holmes has been up to, but has helped him out with some scams in the past, and along with them, they also bring Peitzel's wife and five children. Already at this point, the Williams family is looking into Minnie and Anna's disappearance. They're well-moneyed, and they have the help of the famous Pinkerton Detective Agency. What they don't have, unfortunately is any hard evidence that Holmes is involved. Upon leaving Chicago, Holmes and Peitzel attempt to build a new commercial building on the property in Fort Worth, but they don't have enough money to complete construction, not even by cheating their workers, so they end up instead just sort of traveling the country committing petty frauds and taking their wives and Peitzel's children with them. Yes, I said wives because Holmes has now married Georgiana. A few months later, in early 1984, they find themselves in Philadelphia, and they agree on a scam to fake Peitzel's death and collect on a $10,000 life insurance policy Holmes had already taken out on him. If you remember, this wouldn't even be the first time Holmes had done something like that. He had filed false insurance claims 
for medical cadavers in the past. But in this case, instead of disfiguring a cadaver, Holmes double-crosses Peitzel and kills him in a staged explosion to collect the whole $10,000 for himself. Amazingly, Holmes is able to convince Peitzel's wife that the body was a cadaver and that her husband is hiding in London pretending to be dead uh, until you know, people stop being suspicious about this death. And not only that, he's actually able to talk Mrs. Peitzel into sending her middle three children, Alice, Nellie, and Howard, to go be with their father. In reality, Holmes himself takes charge of the children, and he leads Mrs. Peitzel on an elaborate chase through the country, supposedly staying one step ahead of the authorities. And unbeknownst to her, he is simultaneously housing the children along the way, and sometimes the mother and the children are in hotels that are just separated by a few blocks. It almost seems like during this time he's getting kicks just from being in control. Eventually, Holmes does what serial killers do. He kills the three children. He puts Alice and Nellie into a trunk, a travel trunk with a hole cut in it, and he puts a gas line in the hole. And then he buries their bodies in the basement of the house he's renting. As for little Howard, it's unclear how he was killed. But it wouldn't be long before Holmes's acts would finally catch up with him. On November 17th, 1894, he's arrested in Boston on suspicion of insurance fraud. This isn't a murder investigation right now. The insurance company thinks that he faked Peitzel's death. They think he did what he and Peitzel were originally planning to do. They think that he staged a cadaver to look like his dead buddy. And so they sent the Pinkertons to arrest him. And he is brought back to Philadelphia to face these charges of insurance fraud. But during the investigation comes out that it is indeed Peitzel who is dead. And not only that, the medical examiner is able to determine that his death was not an accident, that the scene was staged. At that point, Holmes is charged with the murder of Benjamin Peitzel. What amazes me is that at this point, Mrs. Peitzel still does not believe that he killed her children. She still thinks they're off in London somewhere. Holmes is telling this crazy story about how he sent them to stay with Minnie Williams, and she actually believes it for a while until detectives actually find the bodies of the children. That is how strong a hold Holmes seems to have had on some people. Now, how many people Holmes killed is unclear. He would eventually confess to 27 murders in total, but some of those confessions were outright lies. For example, he claims that he killed his college roommate, who was very much alive and no doubt surprised to hear reports of his own murder we do know for sure that he killed nine people. And depending on who you ask, some historians estimate hundreds, but that's not realistic if you look at the time period he was around, right? Maybe a few dozen at most. Still, scary stuff. And regardless of how many he did kill, Holmes would only ever be convicted of one murder. In October of 1895, a Philadelphia jury would find him guilty of the murder of Benjamin Peitzel and sentence him to death. To this day, no one has officially been charged in the deaths of Alice, Nellie, and Howard Peitzel, 
nor in the deaths of Minnie and Annie Williams, nor in the deaths of Julia and Pearl Connor. Before his hanging, Holmes would write his memoirs, which he was able to sell, and with that money, he paid to be entombed in concrete after his death, so no one would be able to dissect his corpse. Ironic that a serial killer who got his start with cadavers would not want to become one. He would spend the last months of his life claiming to be possessed by the devil. At one point, Holmes supposedly said, quote, I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer, no more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into the world, and he has been with me since. Unquote. And if you believe in that kind of thing, it is interesting that strange events would happen in the time around Holmes's death. The lead detective in his case would get sick and nearly die. The foreman of the jury that convicted him would die in an electrical accident. The warden of his prison would commit suicide and even the priest who performed the last rites at his funeral would die shortly thereafter on church grounds of no apparent cause. Perhaps spookiest of all is the fire that broke out in the district attorney's office shortly thereafter. That fire destroyed an entire evidence room, except for a photo of H.H. H. Holmes. Holmes would be hanged in Philadelphia on May 7, 1896. Perhaps fittingly, his neck would not break and give him a clean death. He would struggle and twitch for several minutes, just as he enjoyed listening to his victims struggle for air, before he was finally pronounced dead 20 minutes later. But Holmes was only caught because of the efforts of the Pinkertons and other detectives. A century earlier, he probably would have gotten away with everything. Who would have been there to track him down and bring him to justice. And if you think that that kind of serial killer is a thing of the past, remember that even today, the FBI estimates that there are between 25 and 50 serial killers active in the U.S. alone. And not all of them are shady characters. Some of them are respected members of the community, even people you interact with on a daily basis. So think about that the next time you go to the drugstore or check into a hotel. If you liked this episode, you might also like my regular podcast, Relevant History, which is available for free on all major platforms. You can also find all episodes of Relevant History as well as some other stuff at my website, dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening. Welcome to Irrelevant History. I'm Dan Toller. In the fall of 1503, during his fourth voyage to the Americas, Christopher Columbus and his crew found themselves marooned in Jamaica. 
At first, the local people helped the crew and gave them food and other supplies, but Columbus's sailors kept stealing from them, and by February 1504, the people were sick of being stolen from, and they eventually cut off Columbus and his crew. There would be no more food, and without food, the crew would surely die. So, Columbus consulted his ship's astronomical tables, and he saw that there was an upcoming lunar eclipse on March 1st. He met with the local chief, and he told him that the Spanish god was angry, and that unless the chief started feeding Columbus's crew again, the moon would rise the color of blood. Well, the chief, of course, refused. He was as sick of the sailors' thievery as any of the other locals, but then, just a few days later, the eclipse came. It was a full lunar eclipse. That is sometimes referred to as the blood moon, the shadow of the earth cast over the moon, obscures it completely, but because of some complex physics stuff related to refraction, some of the red light hits the moon and it looks blood red. They call it a blood moon, and this filled the Jamaicans with fear. The Spanish god really was angry. Just as Columbus said, the moon had risen blood red, and the chief relented and started feeding the crew again. I mean, whether or not they're stealing from you, it's better to deal with that than to deal with an angry god. And Columbus assured the chief that he would put in a good word with the Spanish god about the people's generosity. That lunar eclipse on March 1st, 1504, meant different things to different people. To Columbus and his crew, it was a predictable, scientifically explainable event. But to the native Jamaicans of the time, it was a sign from God. We modern folks like to think of ourselves as rational, scientific people. If you look closely enough, there's a logical explanation for everything that happens, right? Right? But are there some events so weird, so spooky, that we may never find an explanation that satisfies us? I would suggest that there are. Today on Irrelevant History... We're going to talk about three of those events. The first is something I recently touched on on my main channel, Relevant History. In the year 1453, Ottoman Sultan Mehmed II was besieging the city of Constantinople. Now, this was a big deal. In over a thousand years of history, the ancient capital of the Byzantine Empire had never fallen to an invader. Now, over 75,000 Turks surrounded the city on land and sea. Constantinople was not just the heart of an ancient empire, as Old and decrepit as the Byzantine Empire might have been by this point, Constantinople was also the seat of the most prestigious Eastern Orthodox patriarch. That is a senior bishop, a major religious leader. The seat of the patriarch of Constantinople was and still is one of the holiest sites in Orthodox tradition. But Emperor Constantine XI, desperate for help against the Ottomans, had recently agreed to convert to Catholicism. And many Byzantines believed that by abandoning their faith, they would lose the protection of God. There were also some old legends and prophecies about Constantinople's fall, one legend said that the last emperor would be named Constantine, which Constantine XI was, 
and another said that the city would fall right after a lunar eclipse, which the Byzantines already considered to be bad luck. Well, on May 22nd, 1453, even as Constantinople is surrounded by Ottoman troops desperate for help, a lunar eclipse is exactly what happened. The Earth's shadow obscured almost all of the moon, leaving visible only a crescent, the symbol of Islam. See, it's another lunar eclipse, but it's a different kind of lunar eclipse, and it just so happens to be perfectly spooky for the circumstance. And the people of Constantinople thought that this meant their doom. The Ottomans, meanwhile, they had a different tradition. In their culture, a lunar eclipse meant bad luck, all right, meant bad luck for their enemies. So to the Ottomans, this was a good omen. Four days later, on May 26th, there would be another omen. A strange and eerie light would surround the Hagia Sophia, the most important church in Byzantium. And this light would linger for several hours. An eyewitness named Nestor Iskander describes it as follows. He says, quote, on the top of the window, a large flame was trailing to the outside and surrounded the dome of the church for quite some time. After that, it flew towards the sky. Those who had seen the phenomenon became numb and began to lament and shout in Greek, Lord have mercy, the light itself has risen to the sky. Unquote. Many in the city believed that this light leaving the city was the power of the Holy Spirit leaving the church as punishment to the Byzantines for submitting to the Pope. Sultan Mehmed and the Turks also saw the light and took it to mean the same thing. Constantinople was no longer under divine protection. On May 29th, 1453, three days after the weird light, and a week after the eclipse, the Turks would launch their final assault. By midday, they controlled the entire city, and the Byzantine Empire no longer existed. Emperor Constantine XI, the last emperor, would die in the fighting. Now, we can chalk the lunar eclipse up to unfortunate coincidence, but What's with the bizarre light around the Hagia Sophia? Lunar eclipses happen on a fairly frequent basis. Weird, freaky, supernatural-looking lights, not so much. And tens of thousands of Byzantines, as well as tens of thousands of Ottomans outside the city, witnessed this. It's well attested in numerous first-hand accounts, but nobody can explain it. The best explanation I've seen is from a couple of folks who suggest that it might be ball lightning. But would ball lightning hang around a specific building for hours before dispersing? Well... There was a thunderstorm on May 26th, before the bizarre light. Uh, sources say there was a lot of intense lightning activity around the dome, and that can create circumstances where ball lightning might form. But here's a short description of ball lightning pulled from the July 1997 issue of Scientific American. And you'll note that while it does show up after thunderstorms, sometimes the rest of the description doesn't really track with what happened in Constantinople. Uh, this article says, quote, Ball lightning was seen and described since antiquity, often by groups of people, and recorded in many places. It is, in general, described as a luminous sphere, most often the size of a small child's head. It appears usually during thunderstorms, sometimes within a few seconds of lightning, but sometimes without apparent connection to a lightning bolt. In some cases, ball lightning appears after a thunderstorm, or even before it. Its lifetime varies widely, 
ranging from a few seconds to several minutes. The average duration is about 25 seconds. The lifetime of ball lightning tends to increase with size and decrease with brightness. Balls that appear distinctly orange and blue seem to last longer than average. Unquote. Well, there you have it. Ball lightning. Definitely an eerie, if entirely natural, phenomenon, but even though it's the best scientific explanation for what happened at the Hagia Sophia, it still doesn't really track, right? The eyewitness accounts talk about a glow around the entire cathedral lasting for hours. That's a little different from a grapefruit-sized ball of lightning that floats around for 30 seconds or so. And this leaves us history fans in an uncomfortable position. If there's no scientific explanation, did God really abandon the Byzantine Empire? Well, regardless of your stance on the eerie glow at Constantinople, not all spooky events have to be about something big and grand like the fall of an empire. They can be small, local things that only affect a few people, say, the crew of a doomed ship. The second spooky event I want to talk about is a ghost ship, and there are many of these stories throughout history where sailors run across an empty ship floating alone at sea, or even more haunting, a ship with an entirely dead crew. The particular ship I want to talk about is called the Ourang Medan. The year is 1948. The place is the Strait of Malacca in the East Indies, the gateway from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific. And Dutch and British listening posts in the area receive the following distress call. Quote, All officers, including captain, dead, lying in chart room and on bridge. Probably whole crew dead. Unquote. Then there is a series of random dots and dashes, some unintelligible Morse code, but the message ends with the unmistakable words, I die. Well, this is clearly a ship in extreme distress, so the local British and Dutch authorities dispatch some rescue ships, and with clear skies and smooth seas, uh, some ships soon find the SS Urang Madan about 50 miles from the position where she had sent the distress call. Here's what happened next. And this is according to a memo from senior CIA officer C.H. Mark Jr. He says, quote, When boarding parties reached the Urang Madan, they found an eerie sight. There wasn't a living creature on the ship. The captain lay dead on the bridge. The bodies of the other officers sprawled in the wheelhouse, chart room, and wardroom. The faithful sparks that's the radio operator, was slumped in a chair in the radio shack, his hand still on the sending key. The bodies of the crew lay everywhere, in their rooms and the passageways on the decks, and on all the dead faces was a look of convulsive horror. As a report from the proceedings of the Merchant Marine Council put it, their frozen faces were upturned to the sun, their mouths were gaping and the eyes staring. Everyone was dead. Even the ship's dog, a small terrier, was lifeless, its teeth bared in anger or agony. But strangely, there was no sign of wounds or injuries on any of the bodies. After a quick conference, the boarding parties decided to put the tow line onto the vessel and take her into the port. But at that very moment, smoke and flames belched forth from number four hold. The fire was immediately so hot and so widespread that it was impossible to subdue. 
The boarding parties hurriedly abandoned the vessel and returned to the safety of their own ships. Moments later, there was a terrific explosion on the Oorang Madan, and the vessel sank with all her dead crew. Unquote. But the plot thickens. See, Mark himself, this CIA agent, is getting his story from the proceedings of the Merchant Marine Council, which is a U.S. Coast Guard report, and interestingly, that incident was not reported until 1952, four years after the supposed accident. But the first newspaper reports show up in October of 1948, and the reports are all contradictory. They list different locations, like the Solomon Islands and the Marianas instead of the Strait of Malacca. In one version, a surviving German crew member from the Orang Madan lives long enough to tell his rescuers that the ship was carrying improperly stored sulfuric acid, which gave off toxic fumes. Some other theories have suggested a faulty boiler producing carbon monoxide, that would explain the crew's death as well as the subsequent fire. But carbon monoxide victims tend to fall peacefully to sleep. And the crew of the Orang Madan seem to have died in suffering. The mystery deepens further. See, there is no official record of any ship called the Orang Madan anywhere in the world at that time period. Then again, this part of the world is going through some upheaval in the late 1940s. After World War II, former Dutch colonies have declared independence, and there's been a series of minor wars throughout the area. So could the Orang Madan just be a former Dutch ship with a new name in a post-colonial nation? Yet another question that has been raised is whether or not this ship was being used to transport chemical weapons. See, in the aftermath of World War II, the retreating Japanese army had left large quantities of nerve gas in China. And this gas uh, ultimately disappeared. There are a lot of theories as to what happened to it, but one of the most plausible is that uh, countries like the U.S. or perhaps Great Britain or France, another major power, was smuggling out these gases to add to their own stockpiles. If this were the case, that would be illegal, so it would make sense for that power, U.S. or otherwise, to use uh, a former Dutch ship with a foreign crew hired from a new post-colonial nation would make it awfully hard to track if anything happened to go wrong, as it seems it did. But if that were the case, if the Orang Madan were being used to transport old Japanese chemical weapons and there was some kind of accident, well then, you would think the CIA would know about it, and yet in C.H. Mark's report, he seems completely unaware of any such scheme. It seems as if it's just as much a mystery to him as it is to us. What happened to this ship? And after describing the accident, in the closing of his memo, he becomes oddly mystical. He says, quote, I feel sure that the SS Orang Madan tragedy holds the answer to many of these airplane accidents and unsolved mysteries of the sea. Also, I have often thought about many sightings of huge fiery spheres rising from the sea or disappearing into the sea by ships, captains, and crews in the 18th and 19th centuries. Unquote. And then he goes on for two more paragraphs detailing specific historical accounts of bizarre maritime flames going all the way back to ancient Roman times. And he concludes his memo, quote, Yes, the enchanting sea. What terrifying secret does it hold? I feel sure that the SS Orang Madan tragedy also holds the answer to this secret. 
unquote. The memo, written in 1959, was declassified in 2003. But, intriguingly, the identity of the recipient remains classified. So, what was it that doomed the crew of the Orang Madan? Sulfuric acid fumes? Nerve gas? Carbon monoxide? Some kind of local atmospheric phenomenon? We may never know. And if the CIA knows, they're not saying. The third spooky event I want to talk about isn't so much a single event as a person. Joan of Arc. Now, I don't mean any disrespect by calling her spooky. She is, after all, a French national hero and a Roman Catholic saint. But you have to admit, there is a lot about her story that defies rational explanation. Let's start with who Joan of Arc was. Joan was a simple peasant girl. She couldn't read. She couldn't write and she would have known nothing about politics or military theory. The only thing that sets her apart from her peers is that she's far more religious than them. This being Europe in the early 1400s, someone who's very religious by those standards is very, very religious. But other than that, she's just a very ordinary, very unremarkable peasant girl. That is, until the age of 13. When she's 13, Joan starts to hear voices. Yes, voices, plural, not just one of them. Among others, she claims to talk to St. Michael, St. Margaret, and St. Catherine. Now, A more skeptical person might say that she's obviously suffering from schizophrenia. But schizophrenia is a debilitating mental illness. Hearing voices in your head is not a superpower, and doing what those voices say is not advisable. But in Joan's case, the voices are scarily accurate. When she's 16 years old, they start telling her to go and fight for the Dauphin. Now, the Dauphin is not a marine mammal. It is the heir to the French throne, the uncrowned heir, Charles VII. The French throne is vacant and has been for several years, but Charles has yet to be officially crowned, and England currently occupies half of France. Right, I should have mentioned at the outset that Joan of Arc is doing all of this stuff in the middle of the Hundred Years' War. This is a very long war, as you might imagine, or rather series of wars between England and France. At any rate, you can't just walk up and ask for a meeting with a king, even an uncrowned king who's you know, technically the Dauphin, uh, you need to get some kind of recommendation from somebody who he respects. So, to get access to Charles VII, Joan has to convince her local garrison commander to provide her with an escort to see Charles in the city of Chinon. Now, at first... A guard sends her home and tells her she should be whipped for coming around talking about voices and stuff, but she persists, and she ends up accurately reporting on a series of French military losses in real time, even though news from the battlefield wouldn't arrive until days later. And eventually she impresses the local commander enough that he gives her an escort of five soldiers along with a letter of reference to Charles. So off she goes to see the Dauphin. As it turns out, word of Joan and her miraculous voices has preceded her, and as a test, Charles has someone else dress as the king 
and he stands around acting like a random nobleman. But when Joan enters his tent, she ignores the fake king, walks right to Charles, and kisses his feet. This is not enough for him. He insists that the fake king is the real Charles, and Joan whispers something in his ear. Now, neither one would ever say what she said to him. Charles would only say in later years that it was the answer to a question that he had only ever asked privately to God. And whatever it is, she said, it is enough to impress the Dauphin, and Joan starts giving Charles advice based on what the voices are telling her, and at first his advisors try to keep her out of war council meetings. After all, who is this peasant girl? But she always manages to find a way in, and her advice is always right. In April of 1429, shortly after joining his entourage, Charles grants Joan of Arc a suit of armor, and at the age of 17, she personally leads his troops in a series of engagements, driving the English out of a series of forts around the besieged city of Orléans. She doesn't go into battle armed, she carries a banner to rally men around her, and she serves as a spiritual icon in the front lines. At one point, she is shot in the chest by a crossbow, and after having the wound treated, she returns to battle the next day to lead the final assault against a particular English position. Following the relief of Orléans, another series of successes would follow for the French army with the aid of the young Joan of Arc, and by July of 1429, just three months later, the English have lost more than half their army, and the French have seized the strategically vital city of Reims. There, on July 17th, Charles VII is officially crowned King of France. But Joan's voices are warning her that she is out of time. Within a year, she predicts, she will be captured by the enemy. Eager to finish the war in the time she has left, she presses Charles to advance on Paris and liberate the capital city from English occupation. The French army eventually advances to the outside of the city, but Charles's other advisors want to find a diplomatic solution. They are unwilling to commit sufficient troops to the attack. Joan is at the front, encouraging men to fill in a moat with rocks when she takes a crossbow bolt through the thigh. She is carried to safety against her wishes, and the assault fails. After some minor successes outside of Paris in October and November, Charles signs a temporary truce with the English. And in gratitude to Joan of Arc, he ennobles her entire family, creating the new noble house of Dully. The truce lasts less than six months. In May of 1430, the English attack, and while retreating from an English attack, Joan remains with the rear guard to protect the rest of the troops. The army she is with retreats into a castle, but the defenders of the castle close up the door while some of the rear guard are still outside, including Joan. And just as the voice is predicted, Joan has been captured within less than a year of Charles being crowned. While an English prisoner, Joan of Arc would be accused of heresy, and she would be tried by a panel of clerics and nobles handpicked by Bishop Pierre Cauchon, who was a well-known English lackey and who really, really wants Joan of Arc to be gone. He knows how much of a strong symbol she is for the French. Indeed, 
at her trial, Joan would impress even many of the people trying to convict her, many of the theologians, with her religious knowledge, which again is a remarkable thing for an illiterate peasant girl to be here schooling these highly educated men. Regardless, given that this is a kangaroo court, Joan would ultimately be convicted, but heresy was not a capital offense for a first offense under English law. Koshan needed more, so he has her brought up on charges of cross-dressing for wearing men's clothes in battle. Yes, you could actually be brought up in court for that back in the day, and she's also been wearing men's clothes in prison. Now, She's been doing this, by the way, because the English are holding her in a prison with male guards and the men's clothing is harder to access and, well, helps her to protect herself from being violated by those guards. But the court doesn't care. Again, this is a kangaroo court. And these new charges are so outrageous that even the local head of the Inquisition... Inquisitor General Jean Brahal objects and refuses to take part, but Pierre Cochon gets his conviction, and Joan of Arc is burned at the stake on May 30th, 1431. The English rake back the coals after she has expired to expose her burned corpse and prove to the assembled crowd that she is dead. Then they light two more fires to reduce her body completely to ash and scatter the ashes in the Seine River to ensure that no one collects any relics or mementos. And Geoffrey Thuraj, the executioner at the trial, would later say that he lived his life in fear of hell because he knew he had burned a saint. Joan would ultimately be vindicated by none other than the Pope, Pope Calixtus III. Uh, He would get involved because Joan's mother, along with the Inquisitor General, right, Jean Brahal, the guy who had objected, uh, they asked for a retrial, and they got one. And not only would Joan be exonerated, but Pierre Cochon, that bishop who loved the English so much he had Joan killed, well... He himself would be convicted of heresy by the Inquisition for using a church trial to settle a secular political vendetta. Unfortunately, he had already passed from old age before his conviction, so he would never have to face justice. In 1920, the Catholic Church would even go so far as to officially canonize Joan of Arc as a saint. And Charles VII of France would go on to restore the glory of the French crown and expel the English, more or less, from France. In history, he's often known as Charles the Victorious or Charles the Well-Served. But if Charles was well-served, who was really advising him and leading his armies? Was it a teenage farm girl with schizophrenia? Or was it perhaps something a little spooky? Something that defies rational explanation? If you liked this episode of Irrelevant History check out my main podcast, Relevant History. It's available on all major platforms. You can also find it at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dantollerpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 